So now that we have a rough idea of what EIT is and how does it originate, let's move into the lab and see how EIT can be detected in a compact and relatively simple setup. The experiment that I will be describing and showing you is a rubidium EIT system and is part of the Advanced Quantum Mechanics Lab, a new subject from the Barcelona Quantum Master. As we can see, the system mostly consists of optical elements and it has three main modules an infrared laser source at a wavelength of 795 nanometers, one rubidium spectroscopy module, and one rubidium EIT module. In addition, we have quite some electronic devices, mostly power supplies, signal generators, and oscilloscopes, to control and detect the signals in the experiment. The goal of the experiment is to detect the transparency window of EIT in a three-level system based on three hyperfine states of rubidium-87. In particular, we will be considering the D1 line of rubidium at 795 nanometers and work with a lambda scheme based on two hyperfine ground states and one hyperfine excited state. In this case, the energy difference between the two ground states can be quite small, few kilohertz, which will allow us to use a single laser to address the two relevant transitions. So before starting the actual experiment, the first step is to ensure that our laser is at the right frequency to address the rubidium-87 transition. To do so, we will send a laser beam into the rubidium spectroscopy module and detect its transmission through a rubidium vapor cell. This is the situation that I described earlier in the video. And to measure the spectrum, we will scan the frequency of the laser over a range of several gigahertz and then observe several resonances and as dips in the transmission. These transitions correspond to two most abundant rubidium isotopes, that is rubidium-87 and rubidium-85. They also correspond to different starting ground states of each isotope. The width of these transitions in rubidium is known to be around 6 MHz broad. However, the resonances that we are measuring look much broader than that. Why is that? The answer is the relativistic Doppler effect. The finite speed of the atoms in the cell which at room temperature can be quite large, means that some atoms will move towards the beam and others away from the beam. As a consequence, each atom will experience a different shift in the frequency of the laser light due to the Doppler effect, and this will significantly broaden the resonance that we detect. This complicates our mission of finding the transition precisely, but we can use a trick called Doppler-free saturation spectroscopy. This involves sending a different laser from the opposite direction to the probe beam and, through a population saturation effect, allows us to identify all transitions as narrow peaks. Using this technique, we are able to set the laser close to our frequency of interest, the rubidium-87 f equals 2 to f prime equals 1 d1 transition. Now, let's move to the EIT module. Here, the magic will take place in another rubidium vapor cell to which we will be sending two laser beams. First, we will have to prepare those two laser beams to our EAT lambda scheme. Due to the finite splitting of the hyperfine states, we will need the frequencies of those two beams to be few kilohertz apart from each other. So we need a way of independently tuning their frequencies. This can be achieved by means of a device known as an acousto-optic modulator. These are devices that can diffract and shift the frequency of light through the acousto-optic effect. In our setup, we use two of these devices to tune the frequency of each laser beam by changing the frequency of our radio frequency drive. It will allow us to switch on and off each laser beam independently as well. Once the laser beams are ready, we will combine two different lasers through a polarizing beam splitter and then tune their polarizations to be circularly polarized but with opposite handedness. This can be achieved by a lambda 4 wave plate, which we set right before the glass cell where we will study EIT. Before continuing with the experiment, we have to work on the vapor cell. First, to ensure a high opacity of the medium, we want to increase the density of the atomic gas. This can be trivially done by heating up the temperature of the cell to around 80 degrees, which will lead to a high optical depth. Additionally, we need to have a well-defined magnetic field in the atomic medium which we can achieve by using copper coils that we have wound around the glass cell and running a finite current through them. This will also allow us to tune the energy splitting of the two ground hyperfine states in our lambda scheme. This is a consequence of the Zeeman effect, 
which by introducing a field of few milligauss will lead to a splitting on the order of few kilohertz. So, finally, everything is ready. We will now fix the frequency of the control laser to a fixed value and scan the frequency of the probe beam using its acousto-optic modulator over a window of few hundreds of kilohertz. Upon turning on the control field, we observe the emergence of a narrow peak in the middle of our oscilloscope signal. That is the transparency window we're looking for. Now, by tuning the current going through the coils around the vapor cell, we can scan the magnetic field and hence tune the resonance condition, which leads to a displacement of this peak in frequency. Note that, because of its magnetic field sensitivity, EIT can also be used as a scalar magnetic field sensor. With this final result, we come to the end of this video. We have quickly given an overview of how a rubidium spectroscopy system can be used to study the phenomenon of electromagnetically induced transparency. Interesting directions that could be further studied in this system include the study of EIT in other transitions of rubidium, as well as the possibility of realizing slow light in this system by pulses of light and detecting them precisely in the time domain. Thank you for tuning in.